book of Romans. And I will say that if there is any young men in here, we do have a class in the back. If you're 17 and under, 17 and under. Okay, if not, then praise the Lord. The rest of us, we just stay in here. Amen. Romans 7 chapter, looking at verses 21 through 25. And we know that in this passage that Paul himself is making some statements. He goes on to say that I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. You can be seated. We realize that Paul himself, uh, from time to time, just like any of us, we ha- have our struggles, we have our hurdles that we got to get over, but he's just being open, being honest in this passage, and uh, please follow with me. But he goes on to say, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. I want you to understand, Paul constantly, constantly was warring within his mind. And if you look back upon the life of Paul, even though what had happened before he had got the Holy Ghost, I believe that he struggled each and every day with uh, the things that he had committed against God, especially when it came to the murdering and the slaughtering of other Christians. The Bible says, and bringing me into captivity in the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am. He goes on to make the statement, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Hallelujah. I want to just title this tonight, the law of sin. Okay. And uh, I believe this is good for all of us. I believe that many of us uh, that have gone to school from especially in our elementary years, even into our high school years, that uh, there were different artists that we could bring back to remembrance. I remember one that was well-known in school, and that was Leonardo da Vinci. He had drew some very, uh, very nice pictures. Um, uh, today, those paintings are very expensive. And I remember another one back in my school years, and... Uh, and um, it was about Rembrandt, Rembrandt, and how they were unique. They were different in their different styles of painting, and uh, yet their projections of what they were trying to bring across. Amen. And uh, I want to talk for just a few moments and talk about Rembrandt and understand, uh, I've labeled this tonight, the law of sin, and we're going to get to where we're going to go in just a little while, but I'd like to kind of just build a basis first. But when we look into the life of Rembrandt, we realize that his life is kind of just like a novel. Uh, He was born into a family of millers. He was the eighth child out of nine children. And when it came to the young Rembrandt, he had a single passion growing up. One thing that Rembrandt always wanted to do, and his desire was, was someday to hopefully be a great painter. And he began to paint early on. And after three years of college, at the age of 15, he was apprenticed to a painter that had a great reputation. I I don't recall the name of that painter or who it was, but just from from what history itself reports, we realize that in his early portraits, it reveals an interest in the Bible. And where that had came from was from his mother, and his mother had encouraged him, and she was very pious. Uh, He vividly portrayed such biblical scenes, and uh, maybe you have seen that picture, uh, maybe in the encyclopedia, uh, somewhere in school or whatever, but he had painted one that had shown the picture of Belshazzar gazing at the writing on the wall. You talk about getting somebody's attention. There was something unique about his drawings that got the attentions of others. Uh, He drew another painting that was known for a storm that was on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, He also painted another picture that Uh, when Jeremiah himself was incarcerated and uh, he was praying for the people. And also another painting he painted was, understand, a praying Hannah. We realize that Rembrandt was married to the daughter of a wealthy baker. And of the four children born, understand, now follow along with me. Of the four children born to this union, only one, his son that he had named, which was Titus, survive the infancy when it came, understand, being born. Uh, Rembrandt's paintings fared better 
uh, than his pro progency. Uh, as a young adult, his paintings became quite popular. He became quite, uh, can I better say, known as far as a reputation of a painter. And people would come from hundreds of miles at a time around and pay a small fortune just to sit down and have him draw a picture of them. Uh, it wasn't before long that he was recognized as a link in the long line of Dutch masters um, whose works dominated the 16th and the 17th centuries. Rembrandt himself had became to be very wealthy, very popular, and uh, yet everything it seemed that uh, he had earned, uh, he had just spent it, he had just blown it and thrown it away. He collected all sorts of costumes and armory and, and props for his different paintings that he had put up. Uh, he lived very well off, very large, and understand and spent as if there was never ever going to be a tomorrow that was going to come. When it came to Rembrandt's success, yes, it brought him comfort, and comfort swiftly led to ease. Now understand, listen to what I'm saying tonight because we are going somewhere. And comfort swiftly led to ease, and with the ease came, understand, disillusion. The artist slipped into the familiar pattern, understand, of a moral decline. The significant relationships in his life suffered, and then it just seemed like his world began to fall apart. Uh, at that time, his mother had died and passed away. Uh, just a little bit later, it came to his wife. She had died. When it came to that one child that survived the infancy by the name of Titus, Titus had passed away. You talk about his debts that begin to, st to step up and uh, it, within life himself just a little bit later he had to file bankruptcy. You talk about a world falling apart. His remaining possessions were divided among his creditors. Can I better say this? Rembrandt himself had come to a place of being ruined. He had nothing and no one that was left. And less than a year after losing all of his family, his child, his wife, his mother, he also died. And when he died, he died as a pauper. Uh, we look at his ruin. It was not simply, uh, can I say, recorded in the documents and deeds, but uh, Rembrandt painted dozens of self-portraits. Uh, understand such pictures from uh, visual uh, biographies of a life uh, uh, turned to lethargy but his portrait of himself as a young man shows a strong a clean face understand in clear lightning his last self-portrait shows a different face and in that picture understand at the end of his life it showed a face that was obscured which was of him Something was missing within his eyes. The candles of his soul somewhere had grown dim. And the fire and the sparkle that he once had had all of a sudden left and been gone. You may say tonight, what was the ruin of Rembrandt? Uh, is, was it not a storm that uh, possibly had swept through his life? Because we're all going to go through different things and circumstances within life. But I will say this, friend, it wasn't a cold winter's wind that extinguished the fires within. But when it came down to it, it was a sickness of the soul. A sickness as common to a man's soul, understand, as a cold is to the body. Uh, the common malady was the easy life. The easy life. Things just got to be so easy. And what happened, friend, his soul wasted away while he was at ease. And I will say this, a life of ease always leads to a malady of sin. To a malady of sin. Amen. Just building a basis here and using uh, an analogy right there. We can tonight, and I don't want to take a whole lot of time on uh, this one subject within the scripture, but we can often relate back and forth as we go into Second Samuel, the 11th chapter, and we look at verses 1 through 2, and it begins to talk about David and Bathsheba. And it came to pass that after the year was expired, all the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabab. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. In other words, David didn't go to battle. David stood home and let the men go to battle. 
And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was a very beautiful to look upon. I just want to say tonight that while David understand and David's men were at the battlefield, David was home. And if I can just put it bluntly, he was taking a nap. Understand. In other words, David got up from taking his nap and was strolling on the roof of the palace. And the time when kings go forth to battle, David is at home taking it easy, napping and strolling. Can I say tonight, there is a danger when it comes to ease. There's a danger when we withdraw from the battle. There's a danger when we retract from what we're doing. Because understand, when ease comes along, it can be a malady for sin itself. And at the time, friend, that, uh, uh, that understand that the battle was taking place. And I will say that from the, the vantage point of the roof, he saw Bathsheba. She was bathing, and she was stunningly beautiful, friend. Verse 4 goes ahead and informs us that David sent his agents to get her, and after she arrived, he went to bed with her. Amen. I want to make some comments tonight because we're not just going to relate to this passage, but I believe that within all of our lives, we can relate to different instances. But in a commentary, it goes on to say, and it's Matthew Henry's, that idleness gives great advantage to the tempter. Standing waters gather filth. You know, as well as I do, a river that does not run, understand a river that does not move, understand it's going to become very dirty within because there's something with movement. Uh, The bed of sloth often proves the bed of lust. Amen. And I will say that I'm telling you, a life of ease always leads to the malady of sin. So I want to talk tonight and, and, and bring to you, because we can all understand from time to time, if we're not careful, fall into sin. Come on. Let's be honest. Anybody, you're a human tonight in this place. I want you to understand, friend. Come on. You're still mortal. I want you to understand that if you're not careful and you get into that state of ease, that you yourself can fall into that place of sin. Amen. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about ready to say. Uh, Looking at a woman lustfully does not cause a man to commit adultery in his thoughts. Now, Now understand, let that soak in for just a moment, okay? Looking at a woman lustfully does not cause a man to commit adultery in his thoughts. You say, well, preacher, well, where are you coming from? Uh, He already had committed adultery in his heart. Come on, something had been going around in his heart for some time and and the thought process had been going on and I believe that one of the biggest dangers we got, friend, is when we let something begin to sink on the inside and somewhere it gets down in the heart. And when it gets down in the heart, friend, if we're not careful, that temptation can turn into sin. Amen. It is not lustful looking that causes the sin in the heart. But the sin in the heart that causes the lustful looking. Come on, just because you see something the first time, you may not help it. You may see a beautiful woman or a handsome young man or uh, walking right down the road. And I will say this, it's just something that got the attention of your heart or got your eyes. My point is this, when we let it get down deeper within the heart and, and somewhere there's a seed that begins to build, I'm going to tell you this, you better watch what you start growing, friend, uh, because that can grow into sin itself. Amen. Now, the lustful looking is not but the expression of a heart that is already immoral and adulterous. The heart is the soil where the seeds of sin are embedded and begin to grow. I want to say it once again. You better be careful about what you're growing, friend. Because I'll tell you, there's some things you're going to reap one of these days. The Bible says in Matthew 5 and 28, Jesus said, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now understand this. Jesus is not speaking of unexpected, or can I better say unavoidable, exposure of sexual temptation. When a man happens to see a woman provocately dressed, 
Satan somewhere is going to try to take that and surely try to tempt the man with some lustful thoughts. Can I, let me say tonight, you may say, well, I've been tempted. Because you've been tempted, friend, don't mean that you have sinned. What you've got to understand is when you fall in that temptation and you submit to that temptation, friend, then you're going to fall into sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But there is no sin if the temptation is resisted. And the gaze is turned to elsewhere. The problem where people get in trouble is when they don't turn. Come on, they keep on looking and then they keep on looking. And then what happens is they keep on building thoughts that happen on the inside of the mind. And before long, they begin to fantasize some things that they should have never fantasized. And it leads to sin, friend. Amen. It is continuing to look in order to satisfy lustful desires that Jesus himself condemns. Because it evidences a vile and an immoral heart. Can I say this, friend? This is, when it comes to your eyes, you better be careful because it's going to lead to the chambers of your soul. And what we better understand, hallelujah, some things in life we ain't ain't, going to be able to help. But we better be careful with what gets down in here, friend. Because when it gets down in here and it starts sowing seed, we're going to get in trouble with the almighty God. Now, David was not at fault for seeing Bathsheba bathing. Hang on. He could not have helped noticing her because she was in plain view as he walked on the palace roof. You say, preacher, you're compromising. No, I'm not. Hang on a minute, okay? Slow down and let it soak in somewhere. And I want to make that statement again. David was not at fault for seeing Bathsheba bathing. It's one of those times that, that, that his eyes had contacted something. The best thing you can do, the Bible says, you flee from fornication. You run from it, friend. You don't go to it, but you flee from it. His first mistake was staying at home. Well, I think I'll just take it easy. Understand, and you know, I've, I've gone to many battles. I've, I've fought these battles, and uh, you know, I've done my part. It's about time to let everybody else do their job. You know, I'm going to say this. A leader will get in the battle, friend. A leader is going to fight that fight of faith with them. Amen. But understand, he should have been on that battlefield. His sin was in dwelling, was dwelling on the site and in willing succumbing to the temptation. Come on, we're all going to be tempted from time to time. Uh, amen. One of these days, your wife, a mister, may look at you and say, Hey, look, I don't like the way that you're looking at somebody. She's got every reason to. And I'll say this. uh, Husband, you see your wife looking at 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 someone, another man. I'll say this right now. You ought to have every opportunity to say, look, I don't like the look that I've seen in your face. And I'll tell you what, you better kill it before it kills you. Did you hear what I said? I said you better kill it before it kills you, friend. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, he could have looked away and put the experience out of his mind. There's a popular proverb, and it goes, sow a thought, sow a thought, and reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Are you, under, you seeing where I'm going? Sow a habit and reap a character. Sow a character. And reap a destiny. Because, friend, what you sow is what you're going to become. Amen. It's almost like everything you eat is what you're going to be, friend. I'm telling you something right now. You sow some things in your life, it's what you're going to reap, friend. In James, the first chapter, verses 14 through 15, the Bible says, "But but every man is tempted. He didn't say some is tempted. He said every man is tempted. And when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now we realize that verse 5 informs us that before long Bathsheba realized that she was pregnant, immediately we look at David and what he does. He goes, can I better say, he kind of went into like a a damage control, friend, a a mold. He sent Joab to the battlefield to bring Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. 
home in hopes that possibly that uh, Uriah would sleep with his wife and mistakenly believe that the baby was, was his. There was something about Uriah, friend. He was at the battle and he was fighting. Yes, he was called home, but he had something settled on the inside. I'm not having anything to do with my wife until this battle is done and over with. I think too many times people pull out of the battle too soon and, and somewhere they don't want to just stay in and keep fighting. I think I'll just take it easy and, you know, I put my effort in and I've done what I've done through the years. I'm going to tell you this, friend, when you pull out of the battle, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Amen, and, and understand, and, but it came to Uriah. I must be honest with you, he had better ethics than David, than the king, because he refused to sleep with Bathsheba, choosing instead to sleep at the palace entrance with the king's servants. And because of this, understand, you know, it seems like one sin leads to another. You know, let's just, let's just take the responsibility and accountability, okay? L- let me finish this statement. Because of this, David had Uriah put on the front lines, the battle where his life would certainly be taken. So not only was David now an adulterer, you see how one seed leads to another? But I I didn't mean for it to go that way. I didn't mean for this to happen. No, it's the law of sin. When you begin to sow it, understand, friend, you've got to understand, it's just a matter of time. Uh, it's going to grow and it's going to come to fruition. But one sin leads to another sin. And if we're not careful, friend, understand, it's going to lead to others. So not only was David an adulterer, but he was a murderer. I'll say this. Sin is a vice. And I've made this statement before, but I'll say this. Many, many times statements need to be made. Sin is a vice that takes you further than you want to go. I didn't really mean to go that far. I didn't mean for that to happen. No, but when you yield to that temptation, when you let, can I say this? When you let it bite you, it's got a hold of you. It's got in your spirit. It's done something to you. And when it happens, can I say this? It's kind of like a druggie. It's like an addiction. Well, you know, I, I was just, I was just going to try, you know, heroin one time. Yeah, I mean, I can understand your innocence. But number one, you should have never tested it. You should have never tried it. You should have left it alone. But because you tried it, it's like a vice that got a hold of you. And when it got a hold of you, now it's not going to let go. Then the temptation comes back. And now i got to go a little deeper and i got to have a stronger fix. So it keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you more than what you ever wanted to pay. It's called the law of sin, friend. Law of sin. And Paul lets us know that in verse 18, that nothing good lives in us. Friend, if you think you're perfect, uh, you're sadly mistaken. There's not one in this place. There was only one that came to this world. And that was Jesus Christ that was perfect, friend. But Paul lets us know in verse 18 that nothing good lives in us. In other words, in our sinful nature, there's nothing good. I said sinful nature. Paul sees this part of being human. And although we belong to Christ and have died to sin, we still live in a sinful world and have a sinful nature. Friend, I'll say this. You're you're, you're not delivered until you make the other side. Did you hear what I said? Well, I thought when I got the Holy Ghost, my God, it was going to be easy living for God. Now, I'm going to tell you, be honest, you're fighting a devil now. You didn't have a devil before, friend, but now you got a devil that you're fighting. And, and I'll say this, I, until you get on the other side, you're going to be tempted. I, everything's going to come against you and buck you. I, what do you do? I, you don't take a life of ease. I, you get right back in the battle. I, you keep on fighting. You keep on swinging, friend. Now picture uh, the highly trained commander. Now now listen for a moment, okay? We'll use an analogy. Picture the highly trained commander of a modern tank. Well, I'll tell you what. Have you looked at what different countries have got as far as military? This thing's getting scary. And I'll tell you what, when it comes to different tanks, Russia has got some bad 
tanks out there, I'll tell you. Amen. But let's just take an individual that's highly, he's a highly trained commander, and he has one of these modern tanks. Understand, it's equipped with laser guidance systems. Well, you talk about the electronics, the wizard. You talk about the atomic power that uh, that tank has got. It's got everything it needs. But friend, understand, in preparation for a crucial battle, understand, he has got to load it up. You know, he's loaded up, number one, with the wrong fuel. Come on. He's filled his magazines. I'm talking about, you know, where they put the bullets and everything else in. The magazines with the wrong caliber ammunition. How would you like to have a commander like that? He picked up the wrong maps and directions. He left most of his crew in their bunks. Now the question I want to ask him, how effective would he be under fire? I don't want to be there. I don't want to be there, friend. If those guns are going to jam up those barrels, I'll tell you this, I don't want to be there because I'll tell you what, sometimes the first shot is the most important shot when it comes to some things. I hope you understand it. You go to battle, friend, you better be well equipped. You better have everything organized. You better be ready for what's ahead. I'm going to tell you, that's why you stay in the battle. You don't let them stay home, friend, and sleep in their box. You don't let them take it easy. But I'll tell you this, I've seen, I've, I've seen these sergeants get in front of their men and say, Jump! I remember one time, and uh, Brother Loopy, where are you? Amen. Uh, when there, his two boys were in the reserves. My God, did, did those sergeants not get in their face and say, boy, do, do 50 push-ups. Jump as high as you can. Spit in their face. Do whatever they got to do. You know what was happening? He was getting them ready for battle, friend. He was getting them ready in case something happened. And I want to tell you this, friend. When it comes time, you got to be well equipped and be ready to handle whatever comes your direction. Yet, how often do we undertake spiritual warfare in our own strength? Using our own tools and our own resources. And making up our own directions as we go along. My God. It's no mistake, friend, he gave us this. It's no mistake he gave us this, how to fight things. If we're going to fight it our way, we're always going to come out losing. But if we'll fight it with Christ and do it his way, we'll always come out winning, friend. And I will say we shouldn't be surprised if Satan quickly puts us out of commission. My God. I made a comment some years ago in... And um, I had talked to the church, and, you know, there were a few people in the church that was kind of confused about some things, and they had gone to a conference. I'm not sure if it was a grand or where it was, but, man, you talk about whooping up on the devil. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, they were just punching the devil left and right, and I want you to understand, you had a lot of you people there. You had, you had a lot of people that was punching at the devil and punching at his imps. But I'm going to tell you something. When you get along... I'll tell you, friend, the devil's going to slap you back. Come on. You may give him everything you got at a conference, but I'll say this, honey. Mister, it comes next week. I hope you're still in that slapping mood. And if he slaps you a little bit harder, I hope you pick it up and slap even more harder. So the tension continues. What I do, Paul says, what I do is not the good I want to do. The evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. He's saying, you know, I'm fighting myself on the inside. I'm struggling. And everybody looks back at Paul and says, man, Paul had it made. I'm going to tell you this, friend. I'll, I'll tell you right now. I just talk blunt. I don't think Paul make it in our day and time. You, you, whoa, what do you mean, preacher? That's another Bible study one night, okay? But uh, let me just say this right now, okay? Paul struggled. Paul was fighting a good fight, but it doesn't mean that he didn't have temptations that came his direction. Doesn't mean that he didn't have battles he didn't have to fight. Elsewise, why would he be saying the things that he's saying? And I will say that without the help of the Holy Spirit, the person is dominated by the power of sin and continues to do evil when he actually desires to do good. I want to do good, but it just seems like everything I do, it just goes wrong. 
I, I want to do the right things, but it seems like I always make the wrong moves. Amen. You know, it's going to happen to all of us at times. Just keep on swinging, man. Keep on swinging. So the law or principle at work here is the reality that evil is within us. Even when we want to do good. Come on. In fact, it is when we most want to do good that we become most acutely aware of our propensity not to do so. Help my Lord. Yeah, yeah. How many of y'all started out this year and, man, I, I've got some New Year's resolutions. You mean to do well and you mean to do good and, 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 and you know, it started off good and we're in the fourth day of January and, uh, but January the 5th comes along and I mean to do good. Oh, Jesus, help us. It gets a little further in January. Maybe the middle of the latter part. Well, what happened to that New Year's resolution? You're fighting things within yourself. Things that's coming against you and your spirit and everything else that's happening. So when he faces the current, he finds this law at work. And friend, the current is it's against him. Amen. So according to Paul in, in verse 22... Believers take delight in God, God's law because they long to know it and to do it and thus to please God. This is one of the marks of wisdom according as we read in Psalms 1 and 2. The Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the NIV, and on his law he meditates day and night. The problem is that there is another law at work in the members of our body. From what Paul is telling us. Uh, this other principle that is at work is called the law of sin. And sin is constantly at war with us. Understand, in our endeavor, trying to live for God and do everything we can. I just want to say to each and every one, if you've only had the Holy Ghost for a little while or you've had it for a year or two, just hang in there because you're going to have everything that's going to work against you from time to time. Amen. Sin fights against let me back up. We're at war because sin will not give up the control over us. That it lost when we came to faith in Christ. Friend, I'll say this. When you got in this battle and this fight had been happening and taking place, you got a devil right now that has boosted up everything he's got, friend. He's boosted up his imps, his military, his ammunition, his his tanks everything and, and what we got to understand for him because of your faith in Christ he's got one mission and that is to destroy it but I will say this sin fights against the law of the mind because our mind is where we make our decisions and our moral judgments this is the biggest battlefield you'll ever deal with. It's not who's sitting with next to you. It's not somebody at your job. But the biggest battlefield you're going to have is going to be right up here. And friend, we're prisoners of the law of sin at work with us. We cannot resist our sin nature in our own power. When we try, we will be defeated. I'll say this, that's why we have to rely on the power of the Holy Ghost that is within us in order that we may overcome the law and the nature of sin, friend. You say, Brother Mascroft, can you live above the very reproach of sin? You better believe you can, but you can't do it by yourself. I said you can't do it by yourself. Hey, Amen. You've got to do it in the Holy Ghost. God with you, friend. I said God with you. You can't do it by yourself. Verse 23, now watch this. Paul does not say that these powers are equal. But he knows that they're both there. They're present. And I believe that we must do the same, that one power must be resisted while relying on the other. I resist the sinful nature, and I rely on the Holy Ghost, friend. When we fail to rely on the Holy Ghost uh, for our daily strength, in essence, uh, we provide sin with more power over us in other words I, i'm not 
digging in and living for God like I should and I'm not praying and I'm not fasting. You know what you're doing? You're enabling sin and the power of sin more within your life. But friend, when I dig into what I need to dig in and I start eating what I need to eat from the word of God and I start communicating with him and and let him work on the mind and the battlefield, friend, of my mind and, and I let him get down in my heart. You see, you can work it out up here. But if it ain't taken care of down here, you ain't got nowhere. You're just battling your mind. When you get it settled down here, it makes a big difference, friend. You see, sin's power will not have grown, but our relative weakness will make it seem that way. Sin's power is not an excuse for us to drift spiritually. Or openly give in to temptation. I want to say that again. Some people are always trying to blame this and to blame that. Let's get down right to what it, what it, what it is. Sin's power is not an excuse. God didn't give us a license to go out into sin. Hallelujah. Or for us to drift spiritually or openly give in to temptation. Well, you know, this is happening. It keeps coming back. Resist it. Flee from it. Get away from it. You don't have to mess with it. Don't let it tempt you. Keep on doing it. And friend, when you resist that temptation, it's going to, I'll put it this way, it's going to be less. It's going to come around. I'll say this. You may have to fight some things for years. But friend, I'll say this. Sooner or later, it's going to leave you alone. I believe believers must not forget that ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I want to talk about the power of sin. Now listen carefully. All Christians, you got the Holy Ghost. I'm talking to you tonight. You're you're going to struggle from time to time against sin. Um, I believe that we should never underestimate sin's power we must never attempt to fight sin in our own strength. Did you hear what I said? In our own strength. Why? Because Satan is a crafty tempter, and we have a great ability to make excuses. My God. You know, I believe in heaven one day. We, I hope to see the book, maybe if the Lord's kept it. All the excuses people ever came up with. We have a great ability. You know, we got a great ability uh, to make excuses. Every one of you on this platform, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you, you're all backslid and going to hell. It's quiet up here tonight, ain't it? You know, you know, and why? Because the way you treated me. You don't back me, you don't support me. We're just good at making excuses. And all the time we make all these excuses. We don't grow in God. We don't get nowhere. All we're doing is making excuses. <clears throat> Let me say this. Why don't we become accountable and responsible for ourselves and accept our own faults? They're not my problems. Amen. And we're working together. The devil's going to say a bunch of other stuff, but we're working together. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, my God, I, you know, we're just good at making excuses. Poor me, poor this. Amen. But all Christians are going to struggle against sin. And um, instead of trying to overcome sin with human willpower, I believe that we must take hold of the tremendous power of the Holy Ghost that's available to us. My Lord, and I believe that this is God's provision when it comes to victory over sin. He, he sends the Holy Ghost to live in us and give us the power and the ammunition we need. And when we fall, he lovingly reaches out to us to help. Friend, can I say this? God loves you. God lo- <laughs> You didn't hear what I said. I said God loves you. I'm not just going to say that again. I said God loves you. You know, when I, when I get to the place that I begin to make excuses, how can God even love me? 
I may not understand it, but I'll say this. I do accept what his word says, and I'm going to believe what his word says. And if it says he loves me, it's good enough. He loves me. My God. And uh, how far will God go to reach us, to touch us? Friend, I'll say this. Thank God he's not like me. He's not like you. Because I'll tell you this, we would have wrote people off. We would have assassinated them, killed them, done whatever we had to do. Oh, not me, Brother Mascroft. I got just love. I know you do. You're so full of love. Amen. I want to say this. Sin is not a single act. It is a principle. It takes possession of a transgressor. The moment he violates the law of God. What are you saying, Brother Mascroft? Sin is a tyrant whom none can conquer but God himself. And to know what sin is and to be delivered from it is heaven begun on earth. What do you mean, preacher? Honey, mister, you can't handle it. I can't handle it. But in the Holy Ghost, we can handle it, okay? With the help of God. Amen. I want to use a scenario to bear with me. I'll leave the men in the back. They need some more time, okay? So give me just a little bit more, okay? Paul Harvey, you, and I used this uh, scenario one other time before, but I know there's people here before, people that haven't heard this scenario. Uh, I like Paul Harvey, and he's got a famous saying now, the rest of the story. But um, he tells a story of how an Eskimo kills a wolf. Of how an Eskimo kills the wolf. And it's kind of like the, the tactics of Satan. Uh, when we look at this account, it is somewhat grisly, yet it offers fresh insight to the consuming self-destructive nature of sin itself. And what the Eskimo does is first he coats his knife blade with animal blood. Then what he does, he allows it to freeze. Then he adds another layer of blood. And he'll go ahead and add another layer of blood until the blade is completely concealed by frozen blood. Are you following me, okay? Amen. Next, the hunter fixes his knife in the ground. He puts it right in that snow, in the ground, and he takes that blade that's coated with many different coats of blood and he leaves it sticking up. And when a wolf follows his sensitive nose to the source and the scent and discovers the bait, what happens? He smells that blood. It, it, it attracts, uh, that scent attracts that wolf to where it is at. And uh, he discovers the bait. And what does he do? He begins to lick it, tasting the fresh frozen blood that's upon that knife he begins to lick faster more and more and and uh, along the way he becomes more vigorous and lapping the blade until the keen the keen edge of that knife understand is bare furiously now harder and harder uh, the wolf licks the blade understand in the arctic that night he keeps on going he ain't gonna stop so I will say this, great becomes his craving for blood. That the wolf does not notice the razor sharp sting of the naked blade on his own tongue. Nor does he recognize the instant at which his insatisfiable thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood. What are you saying, preacher? I, that, that scent got him and it attracted him and uh, can I say this? He, he went up and he began to lick it. And, and when he licked it, and friend, it was one thing for him to be tempted. But it went further than being tempted. He began to start licking it. And when he started licking it, he wanted to have more of it. And then he wanted more of it. He wasn't watching what was happening. And, and friend, as that blood came off, uh, that very sharp knife, uh, he began to cut his tongue and cut different parts of him. And, and before long, he killed him. He, he died in his own blood. What do you mean, preacher? You see, 
Its carnivorous appetite just craves more till the the dawn finds him dead in the snow. I believe it's a fearful thing that people can be consumed by their own lust. Did you hear what I said? I didn't say adultery. I didn't say fornication. It's whatever their lust is. When it came to that animal, it was the blood on that knife. He just couldn't leave it alone. He couldn't just hang it up. One lick led to another lick. Another lick led to another lick. One sin will lead to another sin. Another sin will lead to another sin. It's called the law of sin, friend, that I'm talking to you tonight about. I believe, like I said, I believe it's a fearful thing that people can be consumed by their own lust. And thank God for God's grace that will keep us away from the wolf's fate. Someone once said, sin is what produces a moment of gratification and an eternity of remorse. Amen. I want to use another scenario. And uh, this was done by a Sioux keeper, and he had this to go ahead and to say. Raccoons go through a, grand, a, a glandular change at about 24 months. You know, there's something about the instinct of animals. There's something about the instinct of human nature. Some of you didn't catch on what I was saying. Amen. But when it comes to the raccoons, there was a glandular change somewhere around 24 months. And after that, they often will attack their owners. Now, since a 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog in a scrap, amen. I don't know about you guys, but I've heard some preachers from back south. You know, maybe you know a little bit about it, Brother McVeigh. I don't know. Any, anyone else back south? I've heard about coons up in trees. And I, I've heard how these coons will, I'll tell you what, they'll tear a dog up, friend. I, I'll tell you what, it don't matter if it's a third of the weight or just whatever, a fourth of the weight. There's just something mean about a raccoon when you turn him loose, friend. And he's going to be sly about what's happening. But it went on to say that that 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog in a scrap. Uh, He said, I felt compelled to mention the change coming to that pet raccoon owned by a young friend of mine. And by her name, it was Julie. She listened politely as he explained the coming danger that was pro- that was going to happen down the road and she went on he went on to say that I, I never forgot her answer she looked at him and said i just want to tell you it's going to be different from me my raccoon ain't going to do this this will i don't believe it it'll never happen to me can I say this? There are some things that are instinct within. I'll tell you right now, friend, uh, sin is instinct within mortal bodies. Uh, that's why we need the Holy Ghost to fight everything we got every day. Uh, come on, when that raccoon gets a hold of you, uh, that raccoon spirit begins to mock at you. Well, let me just follow along with me. And um, she said, you know, it'll never happen to me. And uh, it'll be different for me. And she's smiling at it. Uh, Bandit, which was the name of the raccoon, he wouldn't hurt me. I know he just wouldn't do it. There's no way my, my raccoon would do it. Well, it was, this is a true story. Three months later, Julie underwent plastic surgery for facial lacerations. Sustained when her adult raccoon attacked her for no apparent reason. For no apparent reason. Listen to me for a moment. Sin too often comes dressed in an adorable skies. And as you play with it, it's easy to say, it'll be different for me. It'll never happen to me. And I will say this, the results are predictable. The very nature of sin is destructive. And anyone who is attracted to sin will be destroyed. Let's stand tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to use another story. And um, there was a family one time that was visiting Niagara Falls 
and it was in the spring. And yet ice itself was rushing down the river. Musicians, you can come on. And as they viewed the large blocks of ice flowing down the falls, they could see that there were carcasses of dead fish embedded in the ice. Now understand, out there there were goals by the scores and they were riding down the river. And what they're doing is they're trying to feed upon those dead carcasses. And as they come to the brink of the falls, their wings would go out and they would escape from the falls. And yet, the one man had related the, the following, this story. He said, you know, I watched one gull which seemed to delay and wonder when it would leave. It was engrossed in the carcass of a fish, its own desires, its own lustful lust, okay? But it was engrossed in the carcass of a fish. And when it finally came to the brink of the falls, out went its powerful wings. Well, you know, I can get away from this, and, you know, I I got just enough time, and I can do what I need to do. And the bird flapped and flapped and even lifted the ice out of the water. And he thought that that bird would escape. But it had delayed too long so that its claws had frozen into the ice. The weight of the ice was too great. And the gull plunged into the abscess. Can I say this, friend? It don't have to look like mud all that can take you down. It can be something big that can take you down. And I will say this, sin is like a cancer of the soul. I'll say when it comes to sin, it's a leprosy of the heart. Come on, friend. Of all the greatest maladies and the vilest of all diseases, you can't afford to take the risk of being entrapped and unable to escape. I, can, I, I know I can do it. I know I can pull this. I, I know I can flirt with it and I can get by with it. It's going to cost you more than you thought it would cost you. It's going to bite you harder than you thought it would bite you. It's going to take you further than what you thought it would take you. Come on, church. Let's talk to the Lord right now. Come on. We all, we all, friend, can fall. But my God, if we'll stay in the Holy Ghost, if we'll keep full of the Spirit, friend. Come on, that nature of sin within us, friend. It can't over, it, 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 it can't take God on. Come on. Come come on. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you. (laughs) Help us to understand, God, the importance, Lord, the importance of God, of your word, and understand that that sin is like a vice, almighty God. (laughs) Help us, Lord, to take heed, lest our souls be destroyed. (laughs) Come on, church. Let's talk to him right now. Can you reach out right where you're at? We appreciate you, Lord. Come on, friend, it's the Lord talking to you tonight. Yes, God, Holy Ghost, talk to us. <laughs> oh, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Lord, never give up on me. Keep on working on me, God. 